Sorry, we don't want that though. Does it have the pause? So, you know, the other day. Okay. Hello, everyone, and happy Friday. I'm Sarah Thorstenson. I'm your executive director. Um, welcome to Pizza and Politics today. I've got a few items to go through. Um, and then we'll get First of all, if you are new to SAR or you're an old timer and haven't been in the building since we did the remodel right before COVID, be sure to walk around, go upstairs. There's actually a room called the living room. And that room is really designed for our members to use. Like if you're out and about, you need a place to work, you need a printer, copier, hey, come on over, need internet? Come on over. You can actually reserve the rooms and meet with your clients upstairs, but it's a really great space. So please go take some time to look, look at it up there if you'd like to. The other thing that I want to mention, SAR related, is we have the Summit Industry Party coming up on the 29th. That is at Copper Resort um, because there are no spaces available for meetings anywhere in the county right now. And Copper is the only spot we could get, but we think it's going to be a really great, exciting space. So we have the Summit Industry Party is what used to be our affiliate trade show. So we'll still have the trade show, the booths. We've also got the class with um, Damian Cox and Scott Peterson that everyone loves. That's 10, top, 10 legal things. What is it that I think we need? Legal corporate. Legal corporate. Yeah, legal corporate. So every topic you ever wanted to know, like working with out of area buyers <laughs> or out of area brokers, <laughs> I'm sure you want to talk about that. Um, so um, definitely plan to attend that. It's a great event. We'll have lunch. It'll be a really great day. So um, sign up for that as well. Um, you are welcome to wear masks for that event. Um, okay, what else? All right, let's get into the event. So uh, welcome to this event. We have oversold this room by 15 people. We have... They're like the airlines. I know. That's <laughs> right. And then drop their seats. Um, so we've got 30 people right now. Um, no, we have 32 people online. So welcome everybody that is online. Um, everyone is welcome to ask questions. Today is designed to be a dialogue. We hope that you will be respectful. You can be angry. You can be very happy. Just be respectful. Um, and questions will be taken from people online. So just type those in the box, raise your hand, and we will get to those as well. Um, let's see. I also wanted to recognize online is Brian Bernardoni, who is our government affairs director, who is monitoring and working on this stuff diligently. So thank you, Brian, for all that you're doing. So with that, one more thing. A town of Breckenridge short-term rental ordinance if you have not heard, that will come up on Tuesday. They'll first discuss it in the afternoon at their work session, which I need to confirm the time. It's either at three or four, probably closer to three. And then they will do the first reading in the evening at seven o'clock p.m. If you plan to attend in person, get there early because it's going to be full. You can also zoom in and they're required to take questions from the public via Zoom. So you can definitely do it remotely as well. So with that, I would like to welcome two of our most fantastic elected officials, Tamara Pogue and Josh Blanchard, Summit County Commissioners. I give these guys, no matter what your politics are, I don't care, from a person that works with them all the time, these people are some of the most responsive, most thoughtful people that I've worked with in my 50 years, I don't know how many years of working with elected officials. They are very, very thoughtful. <laughs> and they are just really great to work with. Um, great people. And as those of you that have reached out to them since their um, proposal came out, I'm sure that you're getting emails back, you're getting phone calls back, they're sending them at 6 a.m., 10 p.m., whatever it is. Um, so thank you very much. So with that, we're going to let them start. They're going to talk about their proposal, how they got there, and then take comments. So with that, thanks everyone. And thank please, there's tons, tons of pizza. Tons of salad over there. Get more if you'd like to. I'm welcome. Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. We appreciate it. Um, and I just want to begin by saying uh, 
Commissioner Lawrence could not be with us today. Unfortunately, she was pre-scheduled to be in Grand Junction working on some other things, but this is equally important to her. So her absence does not in any way reflect um, her disinterest in being here. Um, with that, uh, again, I, I, I'm gonna provide a little bit of a framework in, in terms of the big picture of what we're uh, hoping to accomplish as a BOCC. And really we're thinking about this as sort of a um, part two of our meeting uh, here at S SAR, I guess it was in July. Um, so we're so uh, tomorrow's going to give a little bit of an overview just in terms of where we are today in response to that, especially if some of you weren't able to join us um, then. So the first thing I just want to put out uh, as part of this conversation is this moratorium uh, is, is a pause. It is a pause on what we're doing. Uh, it is not a cap. Uh, some folks are saying they said they were going to do caps and now they're going to caps. This is not a cap. This is a pause. And I think many of you can sort of um, recognize the challenge that our planning department staff has been in uh, in terms of their bandwidth. So we identified months ago that we really wanted to unveil uh, cash incentives, variety of, in of incentives, but really cash incentives uh, for our immediate short term housing or immediate workforce housing issues. And there's been a couple of factors. Number one, most of you, if not all of you know, that we've been going through a shift between our permitting and our licensing process and bringing up host compliance as the platform for that. And that has created some challenges. Um, also, we've responded to realtors and, and particularly our property manager partners with some challenges within the actual framework of the website and sort of the, the process. And so our staff has been working diligently to address those issues. That alone would be more than a full-time uh, position and they're understaffed, we have open positions like so many businesses in some county. When you tack on the fact um, that they're also processing uh, such an increase in um, license applications, that's slowing down the process too. So as the board, we've continue to prioritize this with our staff. And we realized that this is really a bandwidth issue. So we decided to consider this moratorium. We, we are gonna look at the language next week. Right now we're in the stakeholding process, engagement, we wanna hear concerns uh, and, and you know any thoughts. Um, but the idea is to give our staff some time to really be able to unveil the incentive program. Our goal is in four weeks for what we're calling an emergency incentive program. Um, and then we want to get into really a more thoughtful, surgical sort of approach as we look at neighborhood by neighborhood, as we look at um, different types of STR uses, et cetera. And that just takes time. We're in that data collecting phase. Um, and we want to understand the impact really of, of the last 18 months. Um, so that's, that's really sort of the impetus behind this, um, what we will be talking about it at the work session on Tuesday, and then we'll, we'll sort of see where it goes. We recognize that we are challenged by housing. And just larger picture, um, this isn't necessarily a new problem. We know that Summit County um, and towns have had workforce housing programs for decades. We know that our community recognizes it as an issue because they passed ballot measures to put public funds into housing initiatives. And for many years, those worked very, very well. Um, to work with uh, other counties and commissioners from other counties, uh, some account, other, other counties are envious of some of the programs that we have and also that uh, some of the towns have in play here in our community. So we're, we're doing a good job. But we also know that um, we have uh, about 4,500 uh, folks in our workforce that have left the county in the last year based on our migration uh, reports. And how can we keep folks here so that they can you know, work? And so we're trying to address this with a variety of approaches. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll ask tomorrow to talk a little bit about those approaches. And, and one thing that I want to say that we I'm really proud of, the work, the last two work sessions have really been focused on addressing our regulations um, and our uh, sort of codes around uh, planning and zoning. And we've done a lot of work in that. That has not gotten the type of media coverage that this has, um, but we've been doing a lot of work outside of that. Um, and that's really exciting. Commissioner. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank all of you for being here. And 
you know, while Sarah gives us a lot of credit for being um, responsive, Sarah is also incredibly responsive. And we are really grateful for all of the work you do and how um, open you are to contemplating all of the things that we come up with at the county. Um, so I'll just start by saying, you know, I recognize that for you all in particular, this conversation about short-term rentals is um, very hard. And I appreciate you all being here to listen and to ask us questions. Know that for me personally, and I think I speak for Josh as well, I value what you all contribute to our community. I know what you all contribute to our community. You contribute having folks here come here who are going to spend money here and really power and drive so many different sectors. You know, you certainly, many of you, especially if you're in property management, employ folks and provide jobs locally, which I also value. And so for the BOCC, we have been very focused on trying to find strategies that will really, really will work for you all, for everyone that lives in Summit County, for our second homeowners, for the folks that come visit and stay in short-term rental, and for our workforce. And while when we met with you in July, we identified a whole lot of strategies, and I'll give you a brief update in a second about some of those strategies, we've also seen some, what I would call, uh, pretty dramatic shifts in the trajectory um, just since July. And there's probably, there's a lot of reasons for that. We're coming out of the pandemic. Folks are making lifestyle changes once again. Um, you know, surrounding counties are doing a lot in the short-term rental regulation space as well. And so, you know, while we've got certainly our own heightened um, level of conversation in Summit County, it's compounded by, you know, Grand having done a moratorium and Gunnison having put in place caps and all of those other things. Mm -hmm. And so just to give you all a sense of perspective and sort of some data points to consider, since mid-July, um, the county is now receiving about 75 new short-term rental licenses a week. Um, since December of last year, um, so prior to December of last year, about 65% of the total licenses we received in the county were in places I would consider resort, right? Copper, Keystone, areas like around Breckenridge, places where we actually want short-term rentals that were designed for short-term rentals that are doing really just having a very different level of impact than short-term rentals in some of our other more traditional workforce communities like Dillon Valley or Summit Cove. So prior to January, about 65% of our licenses were in those communities. Quite frankly, I wasn't worried. I thought we could proceed how we were sort of going, that we, we had had a pretty reasonable balance. Um, and it was not my top priority when I was elected, quite frankly, to talk about short-term rentals at all. Um, since January, that trend has shifted. So now about 55% of our applications are in those resort areas and 45% of them are in local workforce, traditional local workforce neighborhoods. So not only are we seeing an increase in volume, but we're also seeing a change in terms of where those licenses are. Concurrently, um, as an example, I was at a meeting of about 10 employers in Summit County not a meeting about housing, coincidentally, um, but a meeting about workforce. And I, I, I went around the table and I said, tell me how many employees you all are missing. Um, how many vacant positions do you currently have? You know, for the county, we're short 90 people. Um, amongst those 10 employers, and I think they probably prefer that I not tell you who they are specifically, there was a total deficit of about 1,000 um, people, right? <clears throat> that is pretty significant. Then I went to CDLE, the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, and those are the folks that collect income tax data, they follow where folks work versus where their paycheck comes from. And those folks told me that since the end, since the pandemic, and really this is in even the whole pandemic, this is just the past six months, they've seen an influx of about a thousand people that they identify as telecommuting. So their residence um, is different than where their paycheck comes from is basically what they look at, right? Um, they identify those folks as having significantly higher incomes than traditional in Summit County. Um, on average, it's about $10,000 um, annually higher uh, than traditional workforce. Um, and I think the most staggering number is that they track, again, where folks work versus where they live. And less than 30% of our workforce now lives in Summit County, right? So. For one out of every three of us that contributes to some of the economy, we can't live in Summit County anymore. And so I think it was the combination of hearing for our, our staff how overwhelmed they are with some of these other statistics that we're beginning to realize coming out of the pandemic 
that led us to a point of saying to our staff, what would it look like for us just to take 12 weeks, for example, pause, let us just recalibrate for a second and then figure out what we're gonna do to reverse this trend uh, long-term. So rest assured, we do not think that addressing or talking about short-term rentals is the only strategy. Um, and it's probably not even the biggest strategy, quite frankly. A building certainly is part of the, what we are focusing on. So we have three large projects that are currently in motion. Um, one of those is Lake Hill. Lake Hill has a lot of challenges attached to it because sewer and water are um, very, very difficult conversations. Um, we have the Highway 51 project, which is just up the hill by the water tower. Uh, that's about 200 units. Lake Hill is probably about 500 units over a variety of phases. Um, the one up in Dillon um, is about 200 units. That one also has water challenges. It also has challenges in terms of Dillon Valley Elementary and the fact that that school is pretty much full. And when we do a building project, we have to look at these impacts and mitigate them before we can move the project forward. Um, so that one has a couple of challenges as well. Um, and then we're also working on the development, a modular development um, at the Justice Center. We have a, a very small parcel where we think we can put 40 units. That one is easy, <laughs> it's the good news. And so we really are hopeful that that one will be live somewhere between 12 and 18 months. Are those uh, rentals? Or rentals or for sale? Uh, the Justice Center will be rentals. Um, the Highway 51 will be rentals and Lake Hill mm -hmm. will be a combination of rentals and for purchase. But our housing needs assessment prior to the pandemic uh, identified rentals mm -hmm. as the biggest need. And so that's where we're mostly focused. Um, we also, thanks to Isabel and her family, have mass released the Alpine Inn. That's 38 units. Um, we had 210 applications for those 38 hotel wow. units. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have called you out publicly. People don't always like that. So apologies if you didn't like that. Um, so uh, hotels and rehabbing hotels is also a primary strategy. So as realtors, if any of you work with hotel owners who are interested in master leases or um, selling their property, uh, we'd be more than happy to chat with you all about that strategy. Um, we, as Josh said, this is like not very exciting, but we have revamped um, our, house, our affordable housing codes and our accessory dwelling unit codes. So those zoning changes will sort of have to work their way through the process. They got to go to the, you know, the, the basin planning commissions and they got to go to the county planning commission and then they come back to us. Um, but we have directed our staff to make significant changes in those codes to make it easier for folks to build accessory dwelling units. Um, we're also investigating having what's called a plan library. So basically a set of pre-approved accessory dwelling unit plans that folks can just come in and get, they'd be free, and then they can go off and build. Um, we're also gonna roll out some incentives for folks who have non-compliant ADUs to make those ADUs compliant and we'll pay for some of that work. Um, we uh, are also looking at short-term housing. Um, so we negotiated with the U.S. Forest Service for months over um, making their campgrounds accessible to folks who live in their vans. Um, sadly, the higher we got in the bureaucracy of the U.S. Forest Service, the more um, resistance we met. And so we finally, unfortunately, have a no from them on using their land. So also, if any of you have listings for land uh, that has water and sewer, um, and is zoned appropriate um, appropriately. We do have identified a couple of companies that could build, bring in um, tiny homes, for example, to just put on that property short term and make it available um, for this winter. So we are looking at a variety of strategies, not just this one. Um, the real problem though is when you are in a situation where you're receiving 75 licenses a week, and on average about 30 of those, I think you could say or make an argument are um, displacing local workforce. We can't keep up, we can't build fast enough. We can't find inventory to replace it. Our county commissioners in surrounding counties for the first time really are facing the same situation. So, you know, while we are in active negotiations with Lake County and Grand County about joint projects to build, that takes time and they have less inventory available to house our workforce than they've had in the past. And so we're sort of on this very troubling tra trajectory and the, um, while there's a lot of things we can do long-term, what's the biggest problem is, is right in front of us, right? That we just, um, we, we've got to find some way to stop losing more local housing than we are currently losing, quite frankly. 
Now, all of that said, at the BOCC, um, we don't believe that there is a blanket cap, you know, one size fits all solution to this problem. I mean, for unincorporated Summit County, you just cannot treat Copper Mountain, for example, the same way you treat Dillon Valley. It makes no sense. Can you, sorry, I'm yep. interrupt because one of the questions I've gotten a lot of is, can you explain what unincorporated Summit yes. County is? <laughs> yes, a lot of people think that's the entire county, no. and it is not. So unincorporated Summit County is everything but the towns. I have no ability to regulate in Breckenridge. I have no ability to regulate Frisco, Silverthorne, Montezuma. Well, Montezuma we do. It's kind of quasi. Um, yeah, but okay, that's there. Um, you know, Blue River is its own independent entity, Silverthorne and Dillon, right? So right now you are in the town of Dillon. You are not in or unincorporated Summit County, but if you drive over the hill into Dillon Valley, you're in unincorporated Summit County. Does that make sense? So nothing that we decide today would have any impact on what happens within those limits. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, wilderness is a huge part wilderness, of Wilderness. So the three biggest traditional workforce neighborhoods in unincorporated Summit County are Dillon Valley, Wilderness, and Summit Cove. Everything else is like Quandry Village, very small, right? relatively. But each one of these is totally different. They're different in terms of the balance between short-term rentals, second homeowners, and local workforce housing. They're diff different in terms of their infrastructure. Um, how big are their roads? Are their roads paved or dirt? I mean, all of these things. They're different in terms of um, trash removal, for example, right? They're completely different. And so for us to come out of the gate and say, we're gonna regulate short-term rentals the same way across all of these neighborhoods makes absolutely no sense to us. And so what we're really looking at as the BOCC is long-term, some kind of a strategy that, that looks at each one of these neighborhoods, looks at the actual data in each one of these neighborhoods, the price of a single family home, the price of a condo, what has been the traditional balance in terms of local ownership <laughs> versus front range ownership versus out of state ownership, What's the balance between uh, second home, short-term rentals, and local housing? And crafts regulations that really make that neighborhood work for everyone is ultimately our goal. But to do that takes time, right? And it takes a lot of data mining to do it wisely. And that really is why we landed on this concept of the pause, the timeout, let our staff catch up. We do want to run the, roll this incentive program out because we know we need workforce housing for this winter. And we know there are some folks for whom renting long-term actually could work if we protected them from you know, some of the damage that a long-term renter might do, or if we created some protections around evictions, or if we um, you know, guaranteed their rent, or if we just paid them cash to rent long-term. We know there are those folks out there and we want to find some of those folks too and make it worth their while. Um, and then we wanna look at some of these longer term changes. I'll just end, the other thing that we know is that not all short term renters, rental owners are the same, right? We know we have locals who have STRs. We know we have big invest investors that have STRs. Those two folks should not be treated the same way. And there are, we can create different classes of short term rental licenses that recognize those differences. But again, that's going to take time and it's going to take data. And so that really is why we need this pause and this timeout. I will stop there because I've talked too much, um, but I am, I always do. Josh is far more to the point than I am. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. So wonderfully done. The only thing I'll add is one of the other things we're looking at is um, density, access to services. Um, as we think about our workforce, transportation, those kinds of issues as well. The, the other thing I'll just mention, because this is one of the themes that I'm hearing um, from folks, is why is this a, a taxpayer issue? Why shouldn't the local business community be addressing um, the challenges in living here? And I think we're actually seeing that a lot of what's being dr driven by the market are changing. I mean, we're seeing that people could start working at, you know, Wendy's, I think, for 21 bucks, or we saw this summer for seasonal positions where they were paying $25, $30 an hour. So I think we're seeing local uh, business owners who are increasing wages as response to the market. We're also, I've talked with two business owners this week who are currently um, buying housing so that they can rent to their own employees so that they can secure housing. These are smaller businesses, mid-sized businesses in our community. And uh, so, so they are, you know, folks are starting to think about what can I do to make sure that my employees have a, a place to live 
and they're just to put it out there these businesses are likely to be subsidizing rent for their folks um, because they see of course the value of having employer employees that have um, you know home security in the, in the community and, and that they're happy and they can come to work on time so uh, and stay for a whole season so those are some conversations we're having too and we want to provide we're looking at incentives to help specifically business owners what does this look like we'd love to even see a sort of a framework of where specific segments in the community come together so for example we, one of the areas that this is impacting the most is our restaurants what does it look like if you know several restaurants maybe come together and, and work together on some of these solutions and we want to that's another area that we haven't even really gotten beyond dipping our toe but those are some things that we're we're exploring as well I also think it's important for folks to understand that our bigger employers have been players in the affordable housing space for a long time. We are actually incredibly fortunate in Summit County that they have. When I talk to, um, for example, the commissioner in Telluride, I hear a very different story about the commitment to building affordable housing. So just so folks know, you know, in Keystone alone, Vail Resorts has built Sunrise, Tenderfoot, West Hills, uh, Wintergreen, um, and I think there's well, we're expanding Wintergreen. And we're expanding Wintergreen in partnership with them right now. Copper, same thing, right? The Edge, Sky Shoots. Um, they they really, and they they their PUDs require them to build a certain amount of housing for their employees. Like we regulate that for them. Centura, we don't regulate Centura, but they're building housing right now. Um, so, you know, I, I do, um, as much as I typically, um, maybe not champion our ski resorts as much as I should. In this space, I do think they have more, particularly our larger employers, EGV is another one. They've really worked very hard to build housing. And it's really some of those smaller um, businesses that don't have the same kinds of margins in our largest business, larger businesses where I see the most opportunity um, for us to partner um, and help them contribute as well. All right, questions. Ready? We're ready? ready? Okay. All right. Got it. So yeah. I'm going to start and just FYI, we have 80 people online. So this is one of Sarah's biggest events ever with 140 people. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> okay, so I've got two questions online they'll ask first, and then Brian, you're next. Um, okay, so for whenever we're, okay, it's great that we have these developments, 77, 778 units approximately. And good to hear that this is a multifaceted approach rather than just talking the real estate sector, so I'm just reading. But it seems the real key is more rental options, unlike other communities. We have very few actual buildings that are apartment buildings for rentals, not ownership. Besides renovating a few hotels, can the county provide tax incentives and make it easier for someone to come in and build apartments or leasing only complexes? I would very much like to do that. I would be in support of it. Um, I actually see, going to call somebody out again. Um, Steve and I had an initial conversation about some potential developers um, who might be interested in Summit County and apartment buildings. And um, that's a conversation I very much want to have. Uh, it, again, it goes back to density and we just have to do that in this community. The other piece to this too, is it goes back to um, infrastructure, utilities, getting spaces that would make sense for that sort of apartment style living. Uh, um, right, to, you know, to be attractive to potential developers who want to come in and then also make it make sense um, you know, for a third party to manage that. We, we want to support that, but we don't want to be in the property management you know, business. And so we've got to sort of create, um, create that. And, and we are working on that for sure. Great. Okay. Um, all right. So Mary Waldman said to just to let everyone know about Breckenridge real quick, that it is actually, they are only taking public comments in person, not via Zoom. And it's only in the evening. I think we, on Tuesday, when we consider the moratorium, we are all no, I actually say that now. I don't know. I think maybe we're only taking comments via in person. You know? I think we're prioritizing. We may person. prioritize in person. Okay, so there you go. But you can always email or call yeah. or come to the bar for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, have zoning changes been proposed to allow more than one tiny home on residential land? Please also expand on your effort to bring non-compliant ADUs into compliance. Will they still need to be connected with a breezeway to the main house? 
Oh, we had a long yeah, we about had a long. Go ahead, Beth. Um, yeah. I'll start on Patty Holmes. No, no, you do it. You use Patty Holmes. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to sit here. So I'll, I'll start with her notes. Um, yes, we did have a conversation about tiny homes. We actually looked at three different types of tiny homes um, as they're, you know, they require uh, the degree of which they require, require utilities and certain infrastructure. We've looked at homes that are on wheels. You know, what does that look like? Could a, could a tiny home come in and be <coughs> yeah, yeah. so We're looking at the regulations for that. We are moving forward with making it easier for really more of the permanent on slab um, homes to, to be able to work. Part of the challenge that we're seeing is in many neighborhoods, um, you can add, this is a density issue, um, you can add maybe one ADU, but then when you start, to, when you start take, taking into consideration like multiple tiny homes, that does bring issues with um, everything from public health, you know, water, sewage, uh, parking restrictions, uh, those kinds of things. So we got in starting sort of tiny home complexes. Um, we don't, I, based on the complexity of the issue, I don't think that that type of thing is going to be available to roll out immediately, but we are looking at how we can bring on, um, uh, how we can allow the, the tiny homes, you know, attached to one property, or if it's a blank property, what, what can we look at for that type of, um, uh, you know, structure. Uh, ADUs, we talked a lot about ADUs. Um, one of the big uh, regulations right now is how an ADU that's detached is related to uh, a detached garage. So right now it has to be sort of above the attached garage. There's um, square footage um, maximums of, of a thousand. That was one of the issues that we heard back from so many folks like, hey, I wanna, I want to do an ADU, but I want it to be larger or, you know, or, or smaller or smaller. I want some adjustments there. Um, so we, we basically we're moving forward with uh, eliminating some of those requirements. Um, we're also looking at um, allowing, this is you know, more for new construction, but allowing for ADUs to be below garage, garages, especially on uh, grade properties where it makes sense um, you know, to build that lower. We're also looking at what it would mean for ADUs to be adjacent to a garage. Now there are concerns because we don't want the, the second structure to be larger than the first structure. Um, so we're looking at what that what that may look like. Um, what am I missing? Um, we talked a lot about ADUs that have are on top and next to, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, um, say somebody only needs one garage port, could they use their second for part of the ADU and then have an upstairs? Um, as BOCC, we were supportive of that, although we know there's been, that that's a fairly complex thing to zone, so that one may take us a minute to roll out. Um, I think it's safe to say that for this BOCC, we see ADUs as a solution to our workforce housing. Yeah. Um, and so whatever we can do to make it easier for those to be built or repurposed or brought up to code, um, we want to encourage. Um, you know, there are certainly limits to that just because you, like all things, you gotta find a balance point in terms of infrastructure, but that's generally the philosophy of this BOCC. All right, Brian? Well, it was a question, now it's just a comment, because the first question <laughs> took exactly what I was going to say. But, you know, I I guess I really appreciate the incentive approach as opposed to the punitive approach. I think that that's uh, um, a lot more appropriate from like a personal property rights perspective um, of giving people incentives to do these things, also supporting the ADU. But my big comment has always been, you know, we've always focused pretty heavily on de-restricted properties and, you know, our workforce is not everybody's transient, but we have a very transient workforce that doesn't necessarily want to purchase a de-restricted property or maybe can't even afford to purchase a de-restricted property here. And so, you know, building out or incentivizing developers, which is, you know, the government probably shouldn't be in the business of renting properties, but you know, incentivizing somebody else to come in and do those developments that are purely rental is, uh, I think, where you can have a huge impact. So it was a question, now it's just a comment. So, well, uh, totally agree with that. I mean, yeah. I think I, I try not to criticize the folks that came before me very much, but I think as a community, we missed rental, right? Yeah. You compare yeah. what we've done yeah. in the affordable yeah. housing space to what Route yeah. County has done, for example, mm -hmm. and we've just built totally different types of products and we needed those products. Okay. It's not, but we needed a pipeline of products and we don't have that pipeline in Summit County and it's 
yeah, I think it's a big reason why we find ourselves in the situation we find ourselves in. And I think the strategies that our predecessors took uh, maybe were more appropriate 20 years ago, 10 years ago, um, as it related to sort of the needs of our workforce. Mm -hmm. People wanted to own property. I mean, you all, you're, you're the experts. You know that there's value in obviously the property ownership. And so I think is absolutely as we're shifting um, and addressing sort of the climate of today, uh, apartments and, and rental make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, John and then Dina. Um, the incentive program, I, I've tried to read thoroughly, but it raised the question with me. So you've got a property owner who's long-term renting, who's looking at the grass being greener mm -hmm. on the Airbnb or short-term rental side. How do the incentives apply to someone who's already renting to workforce but is thinking of conversion to encourage them to remain long-term residents is there has there been a discussion about that yeah we, we've talked about that and i you know i don't think we've landed on something yet it's one of the things i hope we will flush out in the next four weeks but there has to be some recognition um, or some incentive for the folks that are in long-term renting to stay long-term renting i'm not talking about the big investors here i'm talking about you know, you and I, who I don't, but maybe you do, own something that you rent to some member of our workforce in Summit County. And, you know, where do we recognize what you are contributing to our economy currently? So I don't know what the answer is. I think it's a tough one because, quite frankly, uh, I was promised a printing press when I started this job, and it turns out I don't have one. Yet. There's, just, <laughs> there's just not enough money to chip away at all of these things. Um, and so Rep McCluskey and I are actually working on a potential bill, although it may not be legal in a Tabor environment, but Honolulu does property tax incentives for folks who rent long term. Um, and so she and I are exploring whether or not the state could do something similar. Um, so that may be the strategy, but it's certainly a concern for me. And I would just mention this piece of they came from Windy City and the owner who helped me today asked about our event. And I told her, and she said, well, just FYI, I have a unit and I'm long term rent. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it does happen. <laughs> okay, Dana. On the um, ADU incentives, is that going to be tied to having the deed restricted, or will it, uh, or, or, <clears throat> and will that deed restriction just be for a certain time, or will it really truly be permanently attached to the property? I think it will have a deed restriction of some kind. Um, I don't think it will have the same deed restriction that you see on, for example, some of our um, for purchase workforce housing. I think it's a different kind of deed restriction, um, but we have not worked with the details of what that may look like yet. Or, you know, again, back to Tamara's point about one size fits all doesn't work for everyone. Um, we're looking at perhaps uh, sort of work, uh, working requirements um so the, the, the you know and there's other programs that exist to do this but so that the uh, property can continue to appreciate um, in, a, in a free market um but that it needs to be occupied by a full-time employee which is again is going to sort of determine some of what those uh, pinch points are um we're also talking about uses number of days that it's occupied those kinds of things and we we haven't landed on anything we're really still gathering that information yet. Great. Okay, let's take a couple online here. <clears throat> this one's a long one. Um, thank you so much for all of your creative efforts and true care and concern in all aspects of those these interconnected issues. I appreciate the BOCC taking a strong and thoughtful lead in regard to solutions. I am hopeful that our towns will take your solutions into serious consideration as they too discuss their own strategies. In particular, it was mentioned at the last meeting and continues to come up in regular conversation incentives, grants, and relaxed zoning and building regulations to help those who would consider an ADU or remodeling an existing area of their home for a studio apartment. This could bring some change faster than building or finding the land to do so. Thank you. Fully agree. Totally agree. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, this one came up at our last piece on politics with you. Um, it seems like the people looking for rental housing are running about eight to one for a place where they can have their dog. Mm -hmm. Yet building is <laughs> adding to the list of no pets for renters. Have you considered these issues? Did yes, you know absolutely. And actually, I was on a call yesterday with a company called Pallet, um, which is out of Tacoma. They are currently building, this is, I 
this is fantastic, I think. So, you know, Pallet basically is one of these companies that <laughs> pre-manufactures tiny homes and then ships them. Um, and they have, you know, a 64 square foot one, a hundred square foot one, and then one for um, families. But in, uh, yeah, tiny, right? Mm -hmm. Teeny tiny. Um, but in, uh, I think it is, I think it's Grand Junction. Their um, uh, animal control shelter folks, which is, I, sorry, you know, the big, what's the big company? or um, nonprofit, ASPCA, yeah, right, that's it. Um, so ASPCA, I think it's in Grand Junction, is actually paying to build, to bring, to buy and build these tiny homes so that folks who are experiencing homelessness but have a pet, have a shelter that they can stay in. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. Um, and I just love the example, so that's why I'm sharing it. Um, but I do, we do have to have rental units with pets. It's part of the culture of our community. Um, and that may not be as attractive to private homeowners who are renting, um, but certainly as we think about our, um, you know, what we're building, I think it's a consideration. Great. Okay. Um, seems like favoritism if you allow a local owner a different type of permit. Staff gets to decide what type of permit is issued. Seems odd that one permit granted for the local owner versus a Denver owner or an out of area owner. I don't think it's about who owns it. I think it's about how many nights they use it as a short-term rental, right? The more nights that a property is short-term rented, it has a different impact on that neighborhood or that community from a water infrastructure, from whatever kind of infrastructure. So um, San Francisco, for example, only allows uh, primary residences to be used uh, for short-term rentals. It's the same petition that's being circulated right now in Frisco. Well, I don't believe you should restrict it and say across Summit County, you know, we will only let primary homeowners short-term rent. I do think that is different than somebody who has a second home and is going to short-term rent it three or six months out of the year, um, and somebody who is an investor who only short-term rents that property. So to me, it's not about who actually owns it and whether they're local or non-local. It's really about how many nights is that property being used for one purpose? Because that, from a from a planning and zoning perspective, that's what creates some of the bigger or smaller impacts on a neighborhood. So as we're looking at the incentive piece, this may lead us to the conclusion that we need more diverse incentive opportunities so that it makes sense depending upon the usage of that space. And again, we don't know yet what that's going to look like. We're, we're, we've asked staff to you know, sort of contemplate some of that framework. Okay, this person's second question, and then we're There's a lot of hands behind you. Yes, I know. And then Donna and then Debbie. Oh my gosh, Amy. Okay, to everybody. Okay, don't worry, we've got 50 minutes. Okay, so the second part of this is shortage of long-term rental is a town issue on not having housing for local long-term rentals. This should not be made a homeowner's responsibility to provide long-term rentals. This is a loss of a right to the homeowner. I will repeat that this should not be a homeowner slash taxpayer responsibility, regardless if they own the home as a second home or an SDI. So I, I do appreciate that uh, comment, and, and I would just reiterate that this again we have we have dedicated public investment funds to address the short term housing uh, to address short term housing in this community. So we have we as the commissioners are responsible for how we use those funds. Long -term. I'm sorry, long term. Yeah. yeah. So we have to look at how we as commissioners um, sort of address that. And we only have a little bit of money. We shared this anecdote at the last one. Um, we have about $17 million in our, in our fund budget for um, uh, housing. And you all know that um, a home sold in Breckenridge at the beginning of the summer for $17 million. So it's sort of like, we can buy a really nice home or we can, you know, <laughs> invest it. In, in, in <laughs> so to the extent, you know, we, we're looking at how we can address you know, short-term, mid-term, and then long-range solutions um, with the funds that have been entrusted to us. They're community funds, they're your funds. Um, you know, how can we best do that? So we absolutely hear that. We're taking that into consideration. Um, but it ha we feel that it has to be a mixed approach. And I would also say, I don't think we can mandate anybody to choose the long-term rent or short-term no. rent for that matter. I do think we can make it more financially attractive for folks to long-term rent, but that's choice at the end of the day. And it, everybody gets to make their own choice. You know, in terms of the regulation of short-term rentals, well, again, I don't believe a blanket approach makes any kind of sense because these are um, 
while some of them are definitely businesses, there does need to be some regulation to make sure that folks, you know, the neighbors, I've all week I've been, um, you know, there's there's some folks in Dillon Valley who have a short-term rental permit and are running a hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> some of I, live next, I live next door. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 The sheriff has responded to this property twelve times in the past six months. There have been violent fights. There are all kinds of trash and parking issues, and so there is an impact on our neighborhood um, from that perspective. And I think that's why, again, when I look at different types of short-term rentals, that some of they just have different types of impacts on neighborhoods, and we have to recognize that. Okay. So. Following the situation, say over 40 plus years, uh, it seems like the community that addressed it the best to me was Aspen. I've got several friends that had moved from Breckenridge area down toward the valley of Aspen. I saw Carbondale do a lot of housing, its structure, et cetera. And then they put and then they provided the transportation for the employees as well. So I see both as key. And then secondly, I didn't hear you say, and I hate to put more work on you, but anything about Park County? Um, yeah, uh, Elizabeth actually has been having some conversations with Park County about um, some developments down there. And, I, you know, again, I, I don't want to see, I would say King County, they probably only have about 15% of their local workforce that lives in King County. And in that scenario, you see other kinds of human service impacts, right? So, for example, they have a higher teen pregnancy rate than, than we do. And a lot of that is because kids are at home alone while their parents are commuting back and forth. So uh, I don't disagree that we need to look at our surrounding counties and help build in those counties and run transportation back and forth. But I do think we need to be careful about the mix and the balance. And I actually would hate to see us look like Pitkin County because so few pigment of, of their workforce can, can live within their county boundaries. I just, there's a balance in there somewhere. Um, and I wanna make sure we don't go too far the other way. Well, one thing I'll just mention to that is one of the key pieces that you just brought up is the transportation piece. Uh, many of you may know oh. that uh, we are going through a transportation uh, strategic planning process, specifically as it relates to the seventh stage. We do have routes, um, commuter routes to our neighboring um, partners. Uh, that essentially Summit County is funding. And so we're having some early conversations and really, again, this is Elizabeth's route about what would a regional transit authority look like? How can we um, help <clears throat> that transportation back and forth? Because right now it's not consistent. It's especially with, you know, the situation we're in with the pandemic. Um, but as we're planning the future and, we, you know, what does it look like for workforce to, to sort of, you know, go back, back and forth? I know developers that tried to start over in Park County mm -hmm. to address the housing for Summit County it was probably too soon. It was about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if they made enough money and it was successful. Like it would be now because it's so desperate. Well, and, and again, part of that developer piece, I was speaking to a developer a couple of weeks ago, and part of it is um, infrastructure. For example, Broadway. Nobody wants to develop any sort of housing if they can't. You know, have consistent, you know, access to the internet and you know roads and, and utilities and all of that. So, what can we do to work with our partners um, mm -hmm. to make sure that the, the, the communities are prepared for this type of density um, in their neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Debbie, and then Toby can go. I have um, I have a few comments and then a question. Um, first of all, I I just want to be clear that most of my clients who buy and want the ability to put some rent are not the investors, nor are they the ultra wealthy. They're buying their first, second home, hoping to have the ability to defray the enormous HOAD. We don't have high taxes, but it helps with that, and then maybe possibly hit some of their mortgage. Um, I have a client who would be an unincorporated in his seven, for example. And um, he comes out and uses his property two weeks in the winter and two weeks in the summer. There's no way he would, I mean, if you could come up with a place for those people to live two weeks and two weeks, he would probably be encouraged if you gave him an incentive. Um, I mean, I, I just bought a second home and I wouldn't have bought it had I known that I, if I couldn't rent it and suddenly I was told, I can't rent it. Um.
defray the cost. So I, I just, um, I think when, when we see comments online and we see, everybody has in mind that these people are wealthy. And while obviously we all are, you know, in the world, buying buying a second home to come up to from Denver, um, which is the majority of where our second homeowners are coming from, the front range, is it's it's it has a huge impact, and they're not they those people if they can't rent are going to stop buying. So I just. Yeah. And then so, you're going to start having more of a demand for short term rentals because those people that own now are long short term So I just want to make that very, very clear. When I think of big investors in the short term rental market, I think of Breckenridge like, Grand Vacation, I think of Dale Resort. And are they supplying adequate housing for the employees that they have to run their short term rental businesses? Who to run? You know, and I know those two are brass, but you've got Dale Resort. and. Um, and I, I just, I really think it's important that the big players um, aren't, are, are actively involved in helping find rentals. You know, we've done a great job in the city of Okay. Sorry, I'll get off my head. And I was just with a client today that has a home, which is a single family home, but it's primarily a rental home. And, and, and anybody that would buy it will likely be a rental house. Have you considered the rental license staying with the home versus the person? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that would be that question. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the other question would come up is in this 12 week period, um, what if I mean, we have a number of transactions where we have rentals, yep. rental properties? And there are rentals on the book. Is the new owner, and they're buying it with the idea that they're going to take over, and they assume that license, or at least honor the rentals that are on the book. And you've probably killed my deal if you're going to tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can take out. So I will tell you that on Tuesday, I am going to advocate for us um, excluding homes that are currently under contract from the moratorium. I just think if somebody signed a contract mm -hmm. thinking they were going to be able to short-term rent, and if there are rentals on the books, we can't we can't keep them from being able to apply um, for their license. So I'm just telling you that's what I'm going to advocate for. I don't know what you know either of the other commissioners will support or not support because we're not allowed to talk about this um, outside of you know a regulatory environment. But but I will be bringing that issue forward on Tuesday. Yeah. And, and I would, I'm going to support that as well. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, again, we'll rely on legal to give us some guidance with some, you know, what are the best avenues to do that? Um, but to the point that, you know, Mara explained, um, you know, we understand that that's a, a big concern. Um, the other thing I'll just mention is we recognize that these homes, uh, there are certain homes that are constructed specifically for the purpose of short-term rentals. And that makes sense in a resort environment and in a resort community. And so uh, we want to do what we can to, you know, again, be thoughtful about how those homes are being used and, and what that process looks like. Um, a couple of quick comments to your other two questions, Debbie. Um, we have talked a little bit about uh, the idea of a rental license sort of staying with the property, sort of like a deed restriction or some of the other easements that may follow along the, the property. Um, we haven't gone real far down that avenue, um, but I think that that is something that we're, we're looking at uh, for sure. So again, your feedback <laughs> that you'd be interested in that is, is helpful for us as we, as we look at that. Um, and then looking back at your, oh, yes, we do recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll <clears throat> uh, mention, you know, I, I live next to door to a short term rental. And I believe you have one in your neighborhood as well. Oh, it's sold. Oh, now they're right. second homeowners, and it's not short term renting anymore. Yeah, so it's not. <laughs> um, so we recognize that even, you know, I would not consider the owner, my neighbor, to be, you know, wealthy by any means. Um, she does rent it, I think, more for a, a commercial uh, income, but she comes up and uses it with her son. And, and we always, you know, have dinner when she's up, they go out and have a glass of wine and that kind of stuff. So I understand that there are nuances. Every homeowner, um, has it for different reasons. We can't legislate policy, uh, you know, obviously on a one-on-one. -on -one. So all of this data is helping us to kind of understand, okay, what are some, some blanket things in neighborhoods 
um, again, kind of taking that surgical approach, we'll look at this um, in specific communities or specific neighborhoods to address that. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, I know you all know better than me, we have seasonal property owners that are here just for the summer. Um, you know, they, they are active parts of our community. They support our nonprofits. They serve uh, in different, you know, advisory councils. And then when they're not here during the winter, they rent their properties and vice versa, right? We have over the hill gang folks who are here. They're on mountain. They're you know, supporting what we're doing there in the summer, during the winter. And then during the summer, their properties are on short term rental. So one of the things that we're really looking at is what do those seasonal rentals look like? They may not be long term, not really short term. Um, the other thing I'll mention is we have had conversations about providing incentives for owners who are here for just two weeks out of the year or four weeks out of the year. Um, and it was actually brought up, I think, by uh, uh, Beaver Run that if there was an incentive program to help uh, the costs of some of this, that they that there could be an opportunity to provide some, um, you know, a place to stay. And quite honestly, it might be really great for a, for an owner to stay on it resort property for the week that they're up here to ski. That might be a really great idea. Yeah. I, I, I get really, really concerned when you start treating parts of the county differently. I do a ton of work in wilderness, and my people that buy in wilderness want to be in the mountains, away from the resort, mm -hmm. away from all of that. But they're, and they rent to people that like to be close to the hiking trails and whatever. And, and if you're going to treat copper and keystone differently than you're going to treat other areas, you're going to create an even bigger dichotomy mm -hmm. of the price point. You know, I mean, a lot of times people don't go to the, the resort because the prices are so much higher. Mm -hmm. And you're, mm -hmm. you're going to devalue their property even more um, by giving, you know, by treating the two properties different. I understand and I don't envy you guys at all. I know you guys have incredibly, and I appreciate everything that you're looking at, but when you start treating different areas differently, um, it, it is, I, I, I don't know, I, I just see it happen and have it on, not a real estate market, but the type of people that we even have as owners up here. I think that we're going to, Start getting the ultra rich that yeah. just buy a property that's not going to have It's like scary. Yeah, you're so I, I, I absolutely hear that. The challenge is what are the other options, right? We don't want a blanket approach um, like they've done in Breck and unincorporated Summit County. To me, that doesn't make sense. We have to acknowledge right now that 30% of the total housing stock we have in Summit County is a short term rental. And there is no way in which that's sustainable if it continues. But I know I've got another question. I know I have another one. Wait, how Debbie, many of those Debbie, people with short term licenses actually rent? How many people just get it? Sure. So they have right. So that is one of the things that we're we're doing a survey right now. That is one of the data points right. that we're I'll looking for sorry. for sure. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> you're required even if you rent one day. Well, and again, that, like that, yeah. I mean, you know, I I think the, the problem is we don't want a one size fits all solution. We don't want too much of a surgical solution because I do understand the shifting in values from neighborhood to neighborhood. I don't know though. I no one's been able to come to me with a, a a third way. If there's a third way, I am all ears because I do see both of those as having problems. Um, but to me, I because no one else has sort of said, well, here's another way to do this. I would rather we were really thoughtful about how we do this using a variety of different strategies because I think we can at least mitigate some of these risks. We can't totally solve them, but we can at least mitigate some of them. Okay, so I'm going to take some questions in the room. If you need to speak up loudly, they're having trouble hearing you from the back in the room. So Erica, right? Yeah. Erica, then Amy, and then Kim. And then I'll do some questions from online. Um, one of the things I'd like to bring up about the ADU, because I see that the commissioners are kind of thinking of that as a good solution, is we not only have a lack of energy units, but we also have to remember we have a lack of affordability. I have a lot of local clients who would rather not rent their ADU at all than have somebody in there full time. I think it's important to recognize for the locals who are living here long term, that is a viable source to rent it out during spring break, during Christmas, during New Year's, and make the money to help them afford their house, afford their family, and help to go out to the restaurants, everything like that that is supporting the community. And I know I have at least three or four clients that would just say, if I am only allowed to do that, I'm never going to build an ADU. 
because I, I want to have the options and I don't want somebody in my house 24 seven because I've got small kids. So I think that's something that we really need to consider because right now you made the point, you know, we can't legislate what people are going to do with their houses, but we have zoned that, right? Baby users are zoned to have a deed restriction. They can't be anything but short term rented. And so I think for the local group, it's important to consider other options. Um, and then the second point I'll make really fast, sorry, Sarah, is that you guys talked about uh, dollar for dollar value. One of the things you might want to consider, um, rather than just necessarily approaching this directly with a homeowner, is maybe approach it with an HOA. If there's an HOA out there that's really struggling and needs a new roof, and eight of the ten are local, maybe you can have a conversation with that HOA about funding their reserve and in turn they change their bylaws for 30 days of local rentals. You might get some more buy-in and you might get a better dollar to dollar approach on that. Yeah, that's an excellent that's a great idea. idea. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Amy. Hi, my question is about the 12 week moratorium. And this is kind of like this question, but if we have a sale in, say, Keystone or Copper that happens during this time that doesn't have a short term rental license and they do want a short term, they're not even going to be eligible to apply until December 14th. No, right? no, no, no. no. This, uh, this moratorium will exclude Copper and Keystone. So those All folks. Of Keystone? Uh, we asked staff to bring us a boundary. We're going to look at that boundary. Um, but I would say, yeah, most likely. I mean, obviously not West Hills or uh, Winter Wintergreen. Um, you know, I think half the folks in Antlers Gulch would like us to exclude them, and half of them wouldn't. So that's a tricky one. But like Keystone Ranch, um, anything yeah. along the golf course, yes, will be excluded. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Ken. Um, my question is very similar, but a little different in terms of logistics, because obviously um, you went to your staff and they were having a horrible logistics problem, but let's hear a little bit more about how that is and what's going to happen with the moratorium. Um, if you employ this 12 week moratorium right now, um, you say that you're getting 75 licenses per week. Um, how long does it take to process uh, an FBI license and can that be streamlined better? Um, how big is the backlog? Right now, how many weeks behind are you? And how many licenses are sitting there um, in good faith trying to get their license but don't have it yet? Um, and um, will they can uh, will the county continue to be offering licenses um, so that people are um, you know applying in good faith, they're trying to get their license, they're trying to pay for it, they're trying to comply. Mm -hmm. Um, will they just be sitting there queuing up? And then will some county enforce non-licensees who've made the effort to apply for licenses and they're waiting? Well, that's a good question. Yep. Oh, no, I didn't write them all down, so you may have to help me with that. Um, I, I'll just a, a approach the 12 week process. Uh, as Tamara pointed out, uh, a lot of this is regulatory. It needs to go to Snake River Planning, it needs to go to the Master Planning, then it comes back to us. That requires um, you know, public hearing, that requires a process. So, that 12 week process, um, that's why it was set to that, you know, sort of that time frame. We asked, what is the realistic timeline that we would? You know, be able to get all of this done, and really, it's kind of 12 weeks from today. So that's what that number um, is. It wasn't just something arbitrary that we just worked with. Um, we're still understanding the process piece. We've asked uh, for people to still be able to, you know, submit applications. We don't know if they're going to be waiting in the queue. We don't know how we're going to be able to sift through yet. Like, oh, this is a this is a copper um, application, so we'll go ahead and continue, um, you know, processing this one. This one is in a different area. Um, so we're going to put a pause on that. So we're, we're, we, that's one of the things we've asked staff to give us some feedback on what that process is going to look like. Okay. No, I mean, I would just say, Kim, these are all the data points that I asked for last mm -hmm. week. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping staff will bring some of those on Tuesday because I do think that they inform how we structure this moratorium and how it works. Well, to Debbie's point, um, people in Wilderness, it's very much um, a, a second home community. Yeah. And uh, people that are buying in that area um, have been expected um, to be able to buy in that area and to rent in that area. And they've been presented with um, history and information um, to make a decision about purchasing their own. That's all over. That's no, right. I know it is, right? Everywhere. And that's what makes this so hard. We're regulating a system that's happening. Like if, if I had a do over, I would have said, do all these regulations before anybody even begins short term renting, right? But, but nobody saw this coming. Nobody certainly saw what was going to happen in the pandemic coming. 
And so that this is very mm -hmm. difficult to do because you have a viable operating industry yeah. that you're trying to sort of figure out some, like any industry, right? Any industry has positives and negatives and you mm -hmm. gotta regulate the negatives so that you grow your positives. But we're trying to do that in the middle of, you know, quite frankly, what feels to us a little bit like chaos. Like we got one county doing one thing and another county doing that. The town's doing something over here and it's really hard to, to weave all this together. There is no perfect solution to this approach other than just to say, all right, we're gonna take a little break. We're gonna be really thoughtful about what we roll out long-term. We are gonna get as much data as we possibly can to make the very best decisions for both the industry and for what happens um, to our workforce locally. I think the incentive approach is um, super appealing and a great messaging piece and something that we can tell our clients. Where a punitive approach is very negative and very difficult and um, <clears throat> creates a lot of um, problems between um, government and um, citizens. That's why I want to do incentives first. And my hope yeah. is that incentives can mm -hmm. be successful so that we don't have to take the punitive approach. And that really is what I'm hoping for. But you guys can all see there are challenges. I mean, the, the sort of detail in which you have to approach this incentive idea is, is pretty mind blowing, so, especially since nobody's really done it on a large scale. So, you know, we'll see. Well, and you've got $17 million, and um, the value of the real estate um, that you're impacting um, with a punitive approach is $750 billion, right? You know, whatever it is, it's huge. Yep. So, it's not the correct hammer for um, the correct response, you know. Okay, I've got a bunch of, I've got 13 questions online. Um, and I know there's a bunch still in the room too. So let me get through a few of these and we'll keep going. Um, okay, I think some of these you've already answered. Let's see, certain parcels of land for sale throughout the county and unincorporated summit um, that are currently only zoned for single families, would you consider rezoning areas for sellers willing to sell, it, to sell and develop and build apartments? We haven't actually talked about that, but I think it is probably something we should talk about. Yeah. Um, we are, and again, I think that's in line with how we're looking at all of our, our zones and regulation, zoning and regulation. Um, I think it has to do with density and, and infrastructure and those kinds of things. But yeah, sure. Okay. Um, this one is, sounds as if you've already decided to execute the 12, they said month, but it's 12 week hold. Is there a vote that is needed at the county board to discuss this before putting in place? If that happens, what day would it affect? That's Tuesday. That's Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, super specific to myself, but how about an ADU over my garage, less than a thousand, but on a lot less than 20,000 square feet and not connected? Yes, no. that is one we um, instructed staff to change. Yep. Okay. Um, and how about rent paid by Summit County employee who also happens to be a child? Okay, that's uh, and then it says Sarah disregard that question. <laughs> um, let's see. I was lost on that one. <laughs> has there been given um, has thought been given to tie STR permits to management companies versus the actual property? Meaning companies are allowed to manage a certain amount based on the number of lo local workforce they employ. Mm -hmm. It's a great, that is a great idea. Yeah. I'm writing that one down as well. So, sir, if I can interrupt, is we're right on that property management thing. So, if some resort group or Pinnacle or whatever has 27 properties in their inventory, can they apply for a license for all 27, or do each of the 27 owners have to apply for a license? Um, I do know of property management companies right now that apply as one. As one. Okay. That, I think that's key because that gets rid of some of your backlog. Okay. In many communities, both in the mountains around Denver and all over the country, people commute to work. More people commute than don't. What options are we looking into to create public bus between friendly and friendly transit? Right. Answer that. And we have we have a few commuter routes right now. We're, we're looking at. But that Kremlin one is one. Yeah, that I think that is key too. Okay, I think you've answered this one too. But what prop? What about properties that have rentals on the books that are about to list? 
Are you saying the owners of properties will not be allowed to listen because the rentals have to be honored? I have three in process now. I, I think it depends. I mean, the details sort of matter on that one. Um, so I don't know that we can answer it one way or the other. And I would say after Tuesday, reach out to the planning um, staff and ask okay. the specific circumstance. Great. And then um, just to confirm, the moratorium does not affect a unit that already had a permit, but it is in process of renewing to, renewing to the new license. Yeah, so this is the shift that we're making between the permit to the license. All of that continues the way um, it's happening. This What's the significance of the shift? What's the difference between So the we've been doing enforcement of short-term rentals mm -hmm. through our planning department um, at, uh, because the state prior to the last legislative session did not allow counties to actually have licenses. They only allow us to have permits. And so that meant that our planning staff, who let me tell you are not experts at enforcement, are doing enforcement and it's not working particularly well. The switch to the license allows the sheriff's office to do the enforcement for us, which is where enforcement really needs to sit. Mm -hmm. So that's so that everybody that has a permit that wants a license gets a license. Okay, yep. and that's yep. the backlog. As well, that's a, that's a big part of the process of what is creating some of the backlog. Right? Yeah. Thank you, stagger them instead of having them all in. We're talking about it to do over again. <laughs> yes, sadly, that was not the option I was given at the time. Thank you. Just give everybody okay, you can have 13 months. So. Yeah, I think there are actually some legitimate statutory problems with the enforcement if we stagger it. Um, and that's why, okay. you know, because then you got some properties where you want planning to do your enforcement, and some properties where the sheriff's office is responding, and that just doesn't. Yeah. You just have to do it. Okay, question regarding uh, the boundary for Keystone. What about Elk Run? It seems to be in no man's land. What are you predicting? I would predict Elk Run is exempt. That's my prediction. Okay. It's a prediction. Okay. I do not have a crystal ball. <laughs> All right. Um, so you're doing a great job answering questions and being so patient. Uh, 30 day rentals are not considered short term. Are there or will there be any restrictions or permits needed? Uh, I, don't, not, I don't know the answer. We haven't talked about it. So I would say no for now, unless somebody comes up around that issue. I think that the SPR application for you all does, and I spoke to Kim yesterday and don't remember it, but that 30 days are not considered short term. Yeah. And I can check that. Yeah. Okay, all right, back to the audience. Okay, I don't know if everybody can go ahead. Then... I, my question is kind of too much what she said a minute ago. I think that part of this impact of the global is people that live here. We're not just talking about influx of new people. Um, and I say this as going to disclose me on a personal level, because I'm a personal home and professional. And there was another person in my office who was in the situation going off in the neighborhood. I have essentially made you. I also have three children, okay? I don't want someone there all the time. I want to rent at Christmas, two or three weeks in March, July 4th, help cover our costs. And I can't do that right now because it's zoned single family. But I can put another family in there full time as a long-term rental. That makes, I mean, maybe, I don't know. If I go back to like the definition of single versus multi, and putting, so as a homeowner in a single family residence, I could put someone in there long term, but I can't do it six or seven years. So I don't know what variances are there going to be any. If we live here and we work in the county and we want to support our ability to live here. Um, so is that going to be looked at differently? And then, um, why and this i don't know it's a policing issue i guess too but could there be another short-term rental license that is um, good for eight weeks of rental a year so we're talking about density and so my house because of density reasons i can't short-term rent it a few two weeks but i can bring in four people to live there full time because it's two bedrooms <laughs> i mean i don't know i'm missing the logic behind some of this um, so it might be a policing issue, but 
could that be an option? That there's a not a blanket short term rental here, you have this is two weeks a year, but you have eight. That's all I want. And I know that that's all that my coworker wants is just to help carry and really those two weeks. And that how much does that help the town then too? Because that's when we need the extra housing or those weeks. So, and I'm sorry, I'm selfish. I don't want to put 22 year olds in my basement with my 11, 12, 15 year old. I just don't feel like that's a good fit for my family right now. Um, but I don't know. So, throwing out there variations to those of us that live here, or maybe yeah. a limited short term rental license that kind of meets in the middle. And I, I have a short term rental next door to me that is booked 48 out of 52 weeks. That really hasn't been an issue, but it might irritate some people. So it would help with some of that neighborhood dynamic too, if it's not all the time. So I don't know. So, so that is one, I mean, we talked about this earlier, right? Uh, that we might want to contemplate different types of licenses. Of course, now we've heard one vote against having a local type license and one vote for having a local type license. So I think it's difficult. Um, and, you know, it's something we're going to need to think about, but there are a lot of communities that regulate different types of short term rentals differently, and I think that's something we need to look at. Well, it can still be based on number of nights, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what she'd right. like yep. to do is just rent those two right. times, mm -hmm. that's right. It should be a lot more lean, right? Yeah, yeah, something else that she's okay. been talking about. Okay, hold on, because I said that part so fast. Um, <laughs> but if somebody's renting in your house, the people who are in your house and who are living there are generally better than. Yes. So it's not the most there's all effort. kinds of data that shows that. Correct. Okay, Riley. Um, just, thank you so much. Um, something that I'd love for you to keep in mind as you guys are approaching the meeting on Tuesday is um, my concern is more for clients that are, we don't want to sweep the rug out from underneath them, that they're in process. Mm -hmm. You know, people that are under contract right now with those rentals on the books or with the intention of, 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 Renting their property after closing, which is coming up, and earnest money is non refundable, and there is no turning back at this point. People that are under construction right now, they've, they've spent time with local builders, local architects. They have this beautiful home that is being built right now as a short term rental in unincorporated Summit County, and now when it comes to completion, they won't be able to get that license. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, people already in process. We'd love for you to. Come up with some, some options for them uh, to protect them and 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 us. Yes. 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 that a lot. So, like I said, we are going to talk about this on Tuesday. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric. Yeah. Just a clarification on the whole in process thing. If people have an application currently in, are they considered in process, or are you going to be stopping it uh, X date, you know, Tuesday, going forward? So. I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about on Tuesday. That's a definite maybe. That is, that is a definite maybe. <laughs> well, it could be just a stop in processing. We could do a full stop. We could just do a series of exemptions that allows folks that are already in process to be processed. There's a variety of different ways to look at this. And some of them are more, or, you know, there's legal issues and implications to them. So we just, we need our staff to bring us some recommendations on these issues. What's the start date of the 12 weeks? We'll talk about that on Tuesday. But if you decide Tuesday, will it be Tuesday? There is, Tuesday. it could be Tuesday, yes. You said something about four weeks in your kind of opening dialogue. Sure. Excuse me. What did what did you mean by that? Sure. So the, the four week goal is our emergency incentive program, which is really a cash incentive program for potential long term uh, renters. So we want to get that going um, as soon as we can because we know folks are trying to hire and house seasonal employees. So that's that's the first step um, to, to address the issue. Have you guys considered rolling out the incentive before doing the moratorium? Um, I wanted to do that, and sadly, um, our staff just has not had the capacity to get the data together to roll the program out. And so that is one of one of for me the primary reason we do a moratorium is to actually fit it because we're surveying all short term rental owners right now on a variety of different questions, neighborhood by neighborhood. And so we need to take that data and apply it to whatever we roll out in the incentive program. And I want our staff to have the time to do that as quickly as possible. 
it, it seems incredibly unfair. I mean, a lot of us have been talking about, you know, in process and properties under contract that basically the planning wasn't there for you guys to change permits to licenses and the staff is getting overwhelmed that it's going to affect all these people that are in process and under contract and that you're having to do this moratorium. You're in favor of excluding homes that are under contract. I, I think that that is a must. I mean, under these circumstances, I mean, it, it should have been a situation where there should have been writing on the wall that once all these permits become due September first, you guys are going to be overwhelmed changing them from you know the permit to a license. Um, plus, you have all the new applications on top of that. So I, there should have been more preparation. You know, well, as opposed to just punishing all these people that are under contract. I don't or, think it's one. We have no interest in punishing folks that are under contract. But that's that's ultimately well, like happening. we've said, we're we're going to talk about it, and Josh and I both support exemption for that. So the writing's kind of on the wall there um, from that perspective. <clears throat> but I do think there is a we could not have predicted the increase in the number of new permits we were going to see come July, combined with the license to the permit, combined with the just general crisis that came out of the pandemic. We just didn't have a crystal ball. We couldn't have seen that coming. And so it's not just the transitions between the, the permits to the license. It's not just the increase in the number of short-term license requests that we're receiving right now. It's not just the employers who are telling us they're a thousand employees short for this. And the fact that we can't hire either that we are short 90 employees out of 500 employees and our capacity is just not what we need it to be so i don't think we're trying to be punitive although i certainly can understand and empathize that it feels that way we are trying like everybody else to deal with the debt that's been dealt um, and to make the very best decisions we can for all of summit county right we do have to worry about our businesses that don't have workforce and we do have to worry about folks that are buying a home right now thinking they're from short term minute. We have to worry about all these things and try and find a balance. And that's really my pledge to you is that I'm going to continue to try and do that um, up to Tuesday, on Tuesday, and beyond. I, I want to make one comment about finding employees. Um, restaurants, I think it's kind of been documented well in the news that because of the situation with COVID, I mean, a lot of people have chose new occupations because there's no security in those type of jobs. So it's almost a bigger problem, you know, than what you're. I mean, just because you, you go build a bunch of apartment buildings doesn't mean everybody's going to flood back into the restaurants and want to be a waiter or waitress or bartender because they don't have any security. You know, if COVID blows up again and they close the restaurants, here they are again, unemployed. So, right, I mean, I and that's right. a bigger problem. Okay, yeah. so we've got a couple more people that haven't asked any questions yet. So, um, there's someone in the back, and then Tom, you want to be there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, Travis. Um, hey, appreciate all your efforts. Um, I am a new realtor here, I've been a broker for years and years, and I've considered some County my second home for decades. Uh, so I appreciate your efforts. Um, everyone, bear with them. Please don't extend the moratorium if it's 12 weeks, do not, do not keep extending it. This is going to upset the balance of things, uh, such as Wilderness has had the largest, you know, property increase last year because people are, you know, discovering it. That's going to, that will slow down there. Uh, and the, and their Band-Aid solutions, and please, I appreciate, I appreciate efforts in trying to take this over. This has been decades in, in, in the coming. Mm -hmm. um, visionaries like Walt Disney, when he went and bought a, oh, millions of acres in a swamp, he built infrastructure ahead of time. He went outside and built large employee housing complexes. They're very nice. That kept cool. I'm not telling you, you know, it's it's a vision, but work hard on that long-term vision of creating as much housing <clears throat> as you can. And if that includes, I don't know how to do this, but getting a Summit County Task Force with vetted, unbiased leaders from maybe one from Breck and Frisco and this and that, who see the big picture and don't have an agenda and really work as fast as you can and as hard as you can on the long-term big housing solutions. Because this can be foreseen as coming, just like the pandemic could have been foreseen as coming. And I spoke to leaders last March because I was sick before it happened okay. early on. Keep so anyway, I, I appreciate it, but build it and they will come. 
Okay. All right. So was there someone in the back that had a question? Okay. All right. So Tom K, and then we're going to wrap up. <coughs> Real quick, your we moratorium, okay, was always because of the information can't have some system. What I also heard in the meeting was that it's also you're looking to re plan this long term strategy plan mm -hmm. leading into the housing. So it's only two folks down there. It's and the incentives. The and third. the incentives. So yep. when there's 12 weeks, yep. you're expecting to come up with a new plan for short term rentals for housing for everything else. It's a very short time, first of all. Okay. So, yep. you know, I commend you guys for taking that on for a very short time. Please do not extend this moratorium anymore. My concern, of course, is that what do we tell our clients is the moratorium for 12 weeks, but after 12 weeks, we have no idea what the county going to come up with. Yeah. If you have to buy a home in the this, well, 12 weeks you can't get your license, but after 12 weeks, you may never get your license. Yeah. Okay? Now, what about if someone talks centers? So it's not only we're going to tell our clients that in the next 12 weeks you can't get a short term license, okay? After 12 weeks, we have no idea what's going to happen in some county. An unincorporated Summit County for short term licenses. And 50% of our buyers are expecting to do short term licenses to cover their expenses, mm -hmm. to cover some of their expenses. Okay. So, and I'm at a loss for the time of clients yeah, for, the, for, the, yeah. you know, for the foreseeable yeah. future. Yeah. And, and, and if that's only Summit County is doing this, Breckenridge is doing this. Okay. And I'm, and I'm really expecting Frisco and Silverthorne and Dylan Jump on the bandwagon of. Of this turmoil kind of stuff. So we are really in a big flux, okay? And we are going to see a hit in our industry, okay, as realtors and kind of help our clients guide them through this unknown uh, for the foreseeable future. And I just don't have the answer. No, I absolutely appreciate that. It's why we are moving as fast as we can. And so remember, our timeline is roll the incentive program out in four weeks and then start rolling out what we're going to or start considering what we can do long term. So I think it really is four weeks of some uncertainty, first of all, not 12 weeks. I think if you're paying attention, and you can be part of the planning commission conversation, lots of opportunity to give feedback on what we're going to contemplate long term. Uh, honestly, there is no rural resort community right now that isn't talking about short-term rental restrictions. Yes. There's just not. So this this uncertainty is not just Summit County. And so I, I don't think it's fair to say to us, uh, real estate is going to move elsewhere um, because there isn't an, a community that's exempt right now. Everyone has to deal with it. I feel for you. I, I know I like I am one someone who hates being asked a question I don't know the answer to, and it happens to me all the time because I know like this much, right? So um, I think I don't know what I honestly don't know what to tell you other than it's four weeks versus 12 weeks, and there's going to be a sense. Know that we're not going to do a blanket cap. Know that anyone who's buying in Keystone and Copper is going to be able to submit licenses in this 12 week period. And that we have no intention of doing any sort of, um, you know, different type of zoning or licensing in those two areas that we have right now. So there's 10 neighborhoods that we've identified. We've been very public about what those 10 neighborhoods are. And I think those are really the neighborhoods in which if someone were buying now, the answer is difficult. Um, but by and large, the majority of the short term license permits we're, we still see are Keystone and Copper. And so for the majority of folks, the answer is not going to be any different than it was yesterday or will be Wednesday. I'll add that again, my, my goal has always been to launch the incentive program prior to this ski season. And we, we were really at a critical point where in order for us to do that, that has to be the top priority. For us to get this out. And so that's really the goal. That's that four week. Um, I know I've said that a couple of times. That's what we have asked staff to do. It may be five weeks. Maybe we'll get it done a little bit earlier, but that's really the goal. The other thing I'll mention is within those neighborhoods, we've been talking about sort of, I don't know what you would call it, subcategories within those neighborhoods. Um, and we're going to try to clarify that sooner than later. What are three of those 10 neighborhoods? Yep. Yeah. Dillon Valley, French Creek, Woodmore, Wilderness. Frisco Terrace, Lakeview Meadows, Mesa Cortina, Summit Cove, Alpine Breck, Quandary Village, and Peak Seven. Yeah, the so, zones. These are the opportunity zones. Although we're renaming naming them, they'll no longer be called opportunity zones because we understand there is other legislation that defines an opportunity zone and means something very different than what we intend. These are the incentive. These are the incentive neighborhoods. Tara, where, where can we find that online? Um, Under our housing section yep. of our, our website. 
So it's in the county housing department. Yeah. Google that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. Great. We've got about four minutes left. I just want to wrap up. Uh, we're not going to take any more questions, but right. I just want to thank everybody. Is this helpful? Yes. Yeah, it's awesome. So much. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, right. This is helpful yeah, for me. Uh, we really do want to understand you know, some of these uh, impacts that we talked about today. Some really great new ideas. So thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. So if you want to learn more about what they're going to do and the decisions they will have to make on Tuesday, attend the meeting at the county commissioner's offices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so just a note of sort of procedure, we will start our afternoon session at 1.30 on Tuesday. We have a couple of other items we need to address first. Um, Elizabeth and I both have uh, school responsibilities for our kids um, at three o'clock. It's back to school night for my new middle schooler. So um, I, we're taking an hour and a half recess um, between three and about 4.30, and then we'll go back until about 6.15 um, when we have to go to Frisco because we have a previously scheduled joint meeting with the town of Frisco Council. So um, we're also doing Rotary at 7.30 that morning. We'll see you guys for bacon. There, there's lots of opportunities. <laughs> and you know we do read our email. We do respond to email and phone calls. So if Tuesday doesn't work for you, um, more than happy to talk with any of you one on one further with other questions. Have you been meeting with Brett Council at all? You said you're meeting yeah. with Frisco Council. Do you meet with no, Brett Council? We have not met. I mean, we've been talking a lot to the Brett Town Council, okay. um, you know, uh, and sort of um, helping them not blanket. Uh, yeah, I can't, you know, we've been had a lot of conversations okay. with them, but we've not met formally with them. Okay. It seems like there is sort of a, a pretty fundamental parting um, of philosophies. And so, yeah. Yeah. So Tuesday afternoon, yeah. these guys. You can email with everybody. Yeah. We I meet will um, in the old courthouse in Brecon Ridge on the yeah. And then you can walk over to the town of Breck. You can. can. Could be a whole our, day of fun for everybody. There are, there are owners of unincorporated that aren't local, so they don't have folks. They didn't vote for you. Can they come in, watch, give their thoughts? Of course. Of yep. And it's online too. Yes, we always broadcast via Zoom. And all that information is on the agenda section um, of our website. Is that been posted? Was it? Yeah, it just came through while we were in this meeting. Uh, great. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, the agenda. Um, okay, just one area of cleanup for SAR, and that is that this class does qualify for one air one credit. Of oh, summit. see what we've given you. <laughs> <laughs> summit area community credit for your SAS designation, Summit Area Specialist designation. So thanks everyone for coming. Grab some pizza and salad to go because I'm sure there's a bunch in there. So thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. I hope you don't mind. Oh no, I, I do it and I don't know. Yeah, I figured. I was wondering if I got a home. Would you say I should follow the following?